Um, I'm very excited to introduce our guest today. She is one of NLI's best and brightest. She studied emotional functioning and people with neurodegenerative disease in her PhD program at UC Berkeley. Her experience as a researcher leads our biggest projects at NLI, translating social and neuroscience findings and distilling information into learning solutions, research summaries, and journal articles to help organizations grow. Speaking of growing, she's an expert on growth mindset, speaking up, Power Dynamics and right now is helping to lead the charge on the science behind allyship to our solution topics. She's a senior scientist and researcher here at NLI. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michaela Simpson. Michaela, it's so great to have you today. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks, Shelby. Amazing. And our leader for today's discussion, an Aussie turned New Yorker who coined the term neuroleadership when he co-founded NLI over two decades ago. With a professional doctorate, four successful books under his name, and a multitude of bylines ranging from the Harvard Business Review to the New York Times and many more, a warm welcome as I pass the virtual mic to co-founder and CEO of the Neuroleadership Institute, Dr. David Rock. Off to you, David. Thank you very much, Shelby. It's great to be here with you. I'm coming in from downtown Manhattan today, uh, where I just kind of home sometimes. Uh, nice to connect. And Michaela, great to collaborate with you again. Um, we always uh, do such interesting things when our brains come together um, seeing the world. So look forward to digging into this big topic with you all. Um, those of you new to us, new to NLI, um, give you just a quick snapshot of us. We're actually 23 years old now, um, which is, I feel old. Um, we are, we're an interesting organization that we do original research, peer-reviewed academic research on the biological foundations of leadership and, and people challenges in organizations. So we're looking at how organizations function or dysfunction often around people and saying, what's the science we're missing? What's the bio biological science we're missing? Most of it brain science, but more broad as well. And then we also advise organizations. Michaela's in our research team, does a lot of the original research we do. Um, and we are constantly looking at um, new ideas, topical ideas, as well as big ideas. And then we advise over half the fortune 100 and, and do that globally. But enough about us, let's um, talk about capacity. And I'm really interested in this session in involving the audience even a bit more than we do. So um, I'm really interested in the connections that you make to these ideas, kind of what this explains, what it's suggesting. Uh, and I know Michaela is gonna kind of keep a close eye on the chat and kind of bring forward some of the interesting comments and, and thoughts as well as questions. So it's a little bit more space for uh, kind of seeing how you see the world as well in here. So first of all, just a, a little bit of a backdrop. Uh, we've been talking about this since March last year that we're all going through psychological trauma, similar to physical trauma with similar cognitive effects. Uh, we went through shock for a few months, long stage of pain, and we're kind of oscillating between the pain and rehabilitation stage at the moment um, in, uh, in, in, in this. But throughout this process, one of the central, central challenges um, is, is really what this does to our brain. And uh, when we're experiencing um, a, 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 threat, a threat response, which is what we've been experiencing all this time, it, there's kind of two ways we can go. Um, when we're experiencing danger, it can be really easy to kind of be really, really thorough and try to be exhaustive and you know dot every I, cross every T, be really thorough because there's some kind of danger around. And that's a kind of natural response to, to danger in many situations. And we do see organizations, you know, really doubling down on like monitoring their employees. We had a whole session on that a few weeks ago. Um, we see people, you know, really getting detailed. Um, and the, the, the trouble with this is that um, in this time when we're experiencing threat, um, we probably just don't have literally the capacity to be as detailed as everyone is being. We don't have as much capacity. Instead of being exhaustive, we need to be essential. Uh, if you're writing a legal document, you need to be exhaustive. If you're managing a legal intern whose brain is exploding, you need to be essential. And we, we often forget that the work shouldn't be how we, how we manage. So <clears throat> the, the central challenge is that threat, um, the, the threat we're experiencing uh, is, is very strong in this time. And as threat increases, all of our cognitive control decreases, but not just control, but capacity as well. Our cognitive capacity. So how much we can actually like hold in mind. Um, and 
the, the, the challenge here is that right when we need a lot of capacity, because, you know, thinking about difficult things during a pandemic and during hybrid, you know, we need a lot of capacity. We need to think really deeply, really widely and make difficult decisions. But right when we need all that capacity, um, threat actually reduces that and makes it harder. So we've been talking a lot about um, for, for a, probably a year about how do we minimize the threat? How do we minimize the threat? But we've never kind of talked about how do we maximize the capacity? <laughs> um, and what do we do about the fact that people's capacity to process is literally reduced under, under level one threat? It's okay, you may be more focused. You don't get a big capacity drop. Maybe you get a focus increase, but anything greater than a level one threat, your capacity to focus really decreases. So this is a this is a word we started working with some years ago. We introduced at the summit, um, it's about four years ago. We introduced this concept of uh, kind of the three big pillars in in neuro leadership, and um, capacity is a really critical one. It's it's helping people process better by understanding the limits of the brain. So capacity, motivation, and bias is something we kind of keep it in the, in the background a little bit. Uh, we use it to design programs and kind of do some of the deeper research. Uh, motivation includes both growth mindset and minimizing threat through, uh, through positive scarf signals, things like that. And obviously bias is about mitigating bias. But we think these are the three most important things that managers need to do anytime, uh, but in, in, at this time, even more. You know, manage capacity, um, provide positive motivation and mitigate bias are probably the three most important things that we, we have to do. So we haven't talked much, but actually we've been working, and in fact, Michaela was involved closely in this project. Um, we've been working on this question for a while. Um, how do we understand capacity and work with it? And we published something that we haven't talked about much in 2020 called the FACT model, which is actually a framework for managing cognitive capacity and thinking about cognitive capacity. And it's different to, um scarf you know scarf is like kind of a seesaw you know you you, you 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 want to have as much as you can on the positive side to minimize the threats on the negative side um you know seeds is different seeds is like um you, you know you're labeling a particular bias at any time so it's a different kind of model and fact is different again fact really describes the four variables to consider and in in any kind of communication delivering a webinar building a slide deck um, writing a proposal, you know, uh, presenting to a customer, talking to a colleague, designing learning, delivering learning, like it's really any kind of communication. Um, what we want to do is work within the limits of the brain um, and you know, start with understanding those limits and work within those limits as best we can. So that's the, that's the framework. And I guess a little bit like ages, which is our learning model, this framework um, you don't want to have anything missing. So you don't want to have three of the four handled. Um, you do want to be taking into account all four variables here. Um, Michaela, anything you want to add just sort of before we dig into the, the framework itself, just about kind of the, um, the, the, the design of the framework or the research that went into it? I know you're involved um, in that team. Right. Um, I think... Um it would be great to just dive into it um, because I think it's explanatory. And I think as you were saying, this was really thought to something that we can apply to everything that we do, you know, whether we're doing our own research and how we um, talk with organizations about how to engage people in behavior change, but also with organizations, how can they engage their people to process information better? Because when we process information better, um, we are better able to do our jobs and actually right. will have, you know, better mental health as well. Um, Definitely. It's, it's literally, you know, what we're saying here that, you know, how much we like the experience, how much we, how easy the information seems to be to dig into, how confident we feel to take action. All of this involves better processing, which literally means better work. And there's a whole lot of research on this. So what this is about is people being more productive, more effective um, and literally doing better work. Um, and by the way, I'll come back to this at the end, probably, but capacity motivation bias is actually a foundation for three things that we assess organizations against now. So we, we started a few years ago to assess organizational talent practices, uh, and we actually go in and, and, and tell a company, look, this is how your talent practices align with capacity or not. This is how they align with motivation principles of growth mindset and scarf, and this is how they accidentally create bias or not. So we've actually been assessing, we're doing that at quite some scale now capacity, motivation, and bias. 
inside all the talent practices that are happening. So it's which is happening for a few years now. Anyway, let's um let's do let's do a little check in before we get into the model. Um, how is your workload compared to your cognitive capacity? In other words, um, if you're and it's pretty self-explanatory, but under capacity would mean you definitely could process more. Like you've got plenty of space, you you know, plenty of time in the day. Um, you, you know, you could be processing more. You're not that stretched. About right is you're stretched at a level that you feel, um, you know, you're, you're in flow quite a lot. You, you don't feel overwhelmed very often. Are you 10% over capacity, 25 over 50 over 75? Let's see what comes in. We've got over 400 people here, which is great to see. Clearly an important topic. Got about 270 coming in. Let's keep them coming. Where are you? Interesting to see some people are under capacity. That's surprising. Um, it definitely can happen. Let's give it another 30 seconds. Interesting data, isn't it? Um, give it another, another moment. Um, if you have a question about the scale or anything, you can throw it in the chat as well. Stephanie's saying being under is why you're being under capacity. Interesting. You, you've got space and time to join us on a Friday. I guess that's true. Some of you will be under capacity, so you have the space to be here. Um, fantastic. Up, right? Yeah, and we will make a recording available as a podcast. So we podcast most of these. Um, interesting. And uh, uh, Kelly's saying quit the last job for being so under capacity. Like feeling underutilized and being under capacity actually is quite painful. It's, um, it's you know, you want to be at at capacity, maybe slightly above sometimes, but but uh, at. All right, let's uh, close that poll off and see what we've got. Michaela, what do you think as you look at this? What are your reflections? Yeah, so, you know, it's, as you said, I mean, we see a lot of people around um, about right and about 25% over capacity. Um, and we have some who are under capacity as well. I mean, we see, I think we see quite a range. Unfortunately, fortunately, there are not too many people who are 75% or more. Um, but I think we see, you know, quite a range of, of people where they are in terms of capacity. Right, right. And I mean, I would have thought it was skew higher, but, you know, certainly when you add up 25%, 50 and 75%, you get a pretty big number. Um, now you're getting almost 50% of people are... Uh, at least 25% over capacity. So about, you know, from what we see here, about half of folks are, uh, you know, quite a lot over capacity. I think if we asked this question in the first few months of the pandemic, we've seen very different results. And again, it depends on like what type of, you know, what we mean by, you know, there might, we probably have different stressors now because of the pandemic. And I, you know, maybe this is a sad reflection on me. I'm like, I'm not surprised that, you know, basically 50% of the respondents are at 20. 25% or 50%, you know, right. I was like, oh, yeah, I, I don't know if it would have been any different before the pandemic, but the stressors might be different. Right, yeah. right. I mean, definitely the, the sort of 12 hours of Zooms back to back has been an issue for a lot of people and right. organizations that haven't addressed that and developed some practices are going to have some challenges. Great. Well, let's dig in some more and feel free to throw any chats and insights uh, in, right. the, in the chat. Um, I'm just going to read out a question um, from Deidre. Would you say, oops, would you say those of us under capacity or 25% or more or over are not pleased with our current situations and may contribute to the shift moves in employment? I, I definitely think so. I mean, the, the data we just saw recently about the great resignation is 40% of people are, are quitting because of burnout and, and burnout is going to be not always over capacity, but it's going to be a big factor. So you've got, you know, 40% of that. Um, Another big chunk of people, the second biggest chunk, was actually organizational changes. Um, and to me, that probably correlates to, again, kind of too much to think about and, and other issues. So I, I think the, um, uh, th there's definitely some issues there. Let's dig in and keep those questions and comments coming. We'll make some space as we dig into the, the framework. But I want to make sure we give you enough time to process this, um, which is actually uh, the T, in fact. Um, so let's talk about the F and the A. First of all, here's the framework. Fluency, amount, coherence, and time. Uh, we spent a long time on this framework trying to get it right and, and looking at many, many different architectures and many different kind of categorizing. These appear to be four independent variables that are all really important for, um, for, for managing capacity. So, so it's, a, it's a framework for thinking about improving processing not just understanding the science. This is the framework for improving processing. So fluency is literally the effort of putting something in your head. The amount is different. It's actually the amount of information 
that we must hold at, at any time. Coherence is, is whether new information fits or how well new information fits to existing schemas and knowledge. And time is, is, is literally the amount of time you have to process that certain amount that fits together a certain way with a certain effort. So there's kind of a natural flow to this. So it's a really helpful framework for looking at something that is just overwhelming and saying, how do we fix this, right? Whether it's a proposal, a presentation, a product, um, uh, you know, anything that you're doing, it's, you know, what's missing? Is it, is it just too hard to process? Who, and we just need to cut it down to a third of the size? Uh, is it the amount? Is it how it all fits? Or is it, is it, you know, we need to give people more time? This is kind of how the process works. Let's talk a little bit about fluency. And um, we've got some, um, got a little bit of research to dig into, not too much, uh, but we'll have an opportunity to hear from you about these issues. So fluency is literally the, the ease or difficulty with which information is processed. Um, visual fluency, you know, is something that feels familiar, feels concrete. We immediately process it in our brain. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting construct, fluency, and something that I'm constantly uh, addressing as uh, I'm trying to develop communication tools. My, what I'm interested in is people getting an idea immediately with as little effort as possible. Um, and I, I always think about how much working memory is necessary in, uh, in understanding an idea and how do we minimize that. Now let's dig a little bit into the science. Um, so this is interesting. The fluency of a candidate's name affects the perception of their capability. So, so literally how easy it is to say someone's name has us believe that they're capable or less capable. So fluency is a thing that um, uh, you, you could think of it as is it activates biases um, and it activates kind of expedience biases in a way. Expedience bias is a feeling of kind of if something feels right, it must be good um, and kind of cutting corners and not actually putting in effort. So lack of fluency means you've got to put in effort and that would activate an expedience bias. Um, so lack of fluency has a remarkably big effect on everything. In fact, there's some research that um, the highest traded stocks are those with the most fluent stock tickers, like GAP is GPS, which is really easy to remember because it's an existing schema. Um, doesn't necessarily show up in their stock price anymore, but uh, there was some research done on that uh, in a number of ways. So it's, it's, it has a real impact. Um, what do we do uh, with fluency? Um, we've, we've got to make sure that there's high contrast between information. And what I mean by that is, um, for the last 23 years, every time I've worked with any graphic designer and our designers now have got it and they're fantastic, but every time I've worked with a new designer, they always put like really stylish lines, one after the other, kind of at the top of a page, kind of smallish font, you know, one line and then a close one, because it looks cool. The problem is you literally can't read it without really, really looking and you can't differentiate between the lines. Uh, and I'm constantly saying, let's make that, you know, as big as we can and spaced over the page so you can literally see each line really clearly. So if you if you pay attention to presentations people give you, you'll see a lot of presentations literally take unnecessary effort to just process the words and process the language. And so as well as kind of spacing out lines, I'm constantly taking out words um, so that things can, you know, be, be done on one line, for example. Michaela, do you want to comment there? Well, yeah, I mean, you're basically talking both about, right, visual fluency as well as linguistic fluency. And so, like, how does something actually look on the page? Can I actually process it? Is it easy for me to understand? And then there's that element, can I actually understand what they're actually saying? Once I can see what they're saying, does it make sense? Can I process it very easily? Right, right. So there's, you know, there's contrast, there's simplifying, there's use familiar things, there's obviously keep it short pronounceable really matters here. Rhyming really helps. There are all these things that we can do to literally make an idea just much easier to digest. Um, you know, we came up with, a, with a, a, a goal one year that stuck with us, I think, for three years at NLI. And every year we come up with um, three goals that the whole organization focuses on, kind of three strategic goals. And, you know, one year it was strive for five. Um, and that, that stuck for quite a few years. And five was literally a you know, five point rating in terms of the feedback that we get from clients and strive for five became a mantra. Three words, sticky, simple, says a lot, uh, familiar, pronounceable rhymes, all of these principles and so much um, more 
it's just used so much more. Strive for five ends up being used so much more than things that are, you know, that have, you know, three or four more words. So yeah, keep your questions and comments and things coming in. Maybe, um, maybe don't try and take anyone's money from, uh, from, um, oh, there we go. Okay. So let's look at um, some of the work that we do. Um, let's look at some of the work that we do with organizations around leadership. Um, there's a constant battle that we have with simplifying. What you can see on screen there is um, uh, taking an incredibly complex set of ideas and turning it into literally three things. Imagine the future, inspire the team, make it happen. The, 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 the fluency of that is really high. Um, imagine the future, inspire the team, make it happen. It rolls off your tongue. You don't have to work hard. Um, there's no, you know, there's no issues. And it's also within a certain amount of information, which is the A, that's really, really helpful. So anyway, this is, this is fluency. Fluency and amount have some, you know, some crossover, um, but amount is also a somewhat independent variable. So you can have something that's really fluent, but it's just way too much information. Um, so the brain can be overwhelmed by literally having too much to process. And, uh, you know, we, we can hold 2X and 3Y is 12, and we can literally hold that in mind and think about what the X and the Y might be. Like we can actually do math with that. Um, you know, we can, we can do experiments. We can go, what if X is two, it's two, it's four, and Y is three, that's nine, four, three, no, not quite it. So you can, you can actually hold that equation in mind and do experiments. You cannot hold that bottom equation in mind and do anything with it. Um, and so the amount of processing is literally about, can you do something with that information? Because if you, if you can't even hold it in mind, you're not gonna remember it and you're not gonna connect the information to existing schema. And if you actually can't hold it, it's just like, it's not actually being processed. So you want an amount of information people are holding that, that they can keep holding. Now, complicated research on this, the most dependable thing is like a three second rule. It's not a seven you know, chunks or a three chunks or, you know, three chunks is definitely a useful schema. We can hold three chunks of anything better than four, better than five and more useful than two. So three is a really fantastic number, but it's really a three second rule, which is the amount of uh, time it takes to say something in our mind's voice. You got a mind's eye, you know, close your eyes, you see things, you got a mind voice. If I say, you know, remember the song Wonderwall, uh, you don't remember the entire song at a, you know, in, in, a, in a second of Wonderwall. I'm not gonna sing it, although it is my karaoke song. Um, but, you know, you don't recall the entire song. You actually recall about three seconds of the song, uh, which is the way audio working memory works. So you got visual working memory, you got audio working memory. With audio working memory, uh, you recall about three seconds, there's some variation, but if you give people a chunk of information that's within that three second rule, they can process it, hold it, do things with it. If it's outside that working memory capacity, they just literally can't process the information. They can hear it, they can see it, but they can't make meaning of it. Right? They can't kind of activate the network on this, their mental stage and compare it to other ideas and, and kind of basically do anything. Michaela, you want to add something there? I think I just want to, as, as a social scientist, I always like to talk about individual differences, right? And so when we even talk about how much information anybody can hold in mind at any time, I will acknowledge there's some who probably can, you know, <laughs> these calculus derivatives down at the bottom could probably hold that, but a lot of us can't. But, you know, in terms of the amount of information we can hold, it varies for different people, but it's also what's the information coming in and going to kind of to the next one, um, not to get too far ahead, but are people getting information that's connecting to what they already know. So if you get information that's completely new and really kind of foreign to you, it's, yeah, it's gonna be much more difficult than you hear information, you're like, ah, I'm connecting it to what I already know. So we actually can take in, in a way, more information that way if it, if it, if it makes sense. So um, I don't right. wanna jump ahead, David, but I just wanna acknowledge that, that it's not just, you know, absolute one way or another, that there's always a continuum. Yeah, there's a connection between these things. So, you know, fluency has a bit of a connection to amount. Amount has a connection to coherence um, because you can hold much more if it actually fits. If it fits, if it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and so we'll move on to coherence in a moment. Um, they're kind of, they're independent variables, but they have some interesting connections to the other variables. So, so, so what you want is as little effort as process to, as, as you can to process um, 
a, sm a small amount of information as you possibly can. Um, and, and how we do that, we wanna, we wanna make things visual. So we, the visual network is much more robust than the auditory network. So you don't wanna attack, you know, you don't wanna activate that three second rule um, with, with people having to hear what you've said. You want people seeing what you've said. You, know, you don't want people to hear what you've said, you want them to see what you've said. And the reason for that is the visual working memory just holds a ton more information than audio working memory. So hearing something, uh, you know, I say, you know, I say the word elephant and you don't picture it, uh, you're not activating a lot of networks, but if I say the word elephant and you picture an elephant, you activate a ton more neurons in your visual cortex, language center, memory center, all this stuff. But the visual cortex in particular is very big, at the back of the head, the occipital lobe, and you just you just you've got a more robust network to then connect to other networks. So there's there's a very tangible, quite concrete reason for making things visual is you you're just harnessing a much bigger network which enables you to test that network and, and explore it and consider it and connect it to other networks and all that. Now, of course, we want to simplify. We want to get to the essential. We want to take larger units, bro you know, break them down into steps. Uh, chunking is a really, really powerful thing. And anytime you take a lot of information, and try and chunk it into three or three by three, or you know, try to chunk it into three or no more than four categories. Uh, anytime you feel overwhelmed is a is a great first step. Okay. Yes, I just wanted to acknowledge um, what BJ made a comment about when I talked. We had that um, complex math math um, problem there, and he said people who work or she they said people who work with the complex formula also have a single word for each of the factors. So basically, he's talking about taking the complex and doing what you're saying, simplifying, right? So something can be very complex, but and a lot of information, but we find ways to simplify it, and right. so. Um, you know, yeah, just gave, and they just gave us an example of that. That's no, a great example. How we do that is we we chunk. So, for example, if you if you watched um, there's that great series on Netflix about the the woman who's incredible at chess. I've forgotten what it's called. Someone will put it in. Um, the uh, um, but anyway, if you if you study kind of chess and chess masters, um, it's 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 not so much that they understand. Oh, the Queen's Gambit. Thank you. It's not so much that they understand. You know, every possible move. They actually chunked, and so they know the like. They've, they've got a chunk for a certain kind of move um, that starts with a, you know, the, the left hand pawn, you know, going forward to like, they've got a chunk for that and they can see what tends to happen and a chunk for the, uh, for all these different moves and they can compare chunks. Um, and so it, there's a, it, it, there's a lot of research on chunk acquisition and how we kind of form these chunks and how useful they are. Uh, but you can leverage that and just make sure that you're always grouping and organizing into three or, or at most four as we, uh, as we lean into that. All right, a little bit more um, on uh, on this topic. It's such a it's such a rich one, um, and I'd love to hear from the audience. And maybe Michaela, you you know you have some thoughts as well, and see what's coming up. Um, what's behind the lack of fluency and the overwhelming amount of information in our organization? So when we think about organizations, things are just often far too complex, too much information, not fluent. Um, What's behind that, you think? Let's get some comments in the chat. What do you think drives lack of fluency and the overwhelming amount of information? A few interesting things coming up. Michaela, do you want to take a look there? Sorry, let me come off you. I'm just looking at the responses. Yeah, there, is a, there is a sense of panic. And Mickey was saying a bit of panic. You know, we've got to include everything. That's kind of what I was saying at the beginning today, that... Um, that when there's a lot of stress, sometimes we go to being exhaustive. You know, we feel like we have to cover everything because of our anxiety. Um, and, you know, that, that could definitely be it. Um, we, we're, we're anxious about every possible bad thing, so we feel like we've got to cover it. Right, and Chad said, you know, people try to be efficient and shove tons of info into small spaces. Um, lack of trust from Melissa, lack of trust that people get it. Um, that there's constant change happening. Um, lack of prioritization, that's a big one, right? How do we discover what's essential? Um, you know, because we're often, as you know, we're often bombarded with so much information and part of that skill is, okay, what is it that we actually need to accomplish? What do we need to do? What are our priorities? Right. There's something, there's a comment there I wanted to riff on for a moment as you look, but there's something about leaders who, who try to kind of raise their status by using a lot of words or even by just filling a lot of space. Um, there, there are leaders who want to who kind of prove their status with the big, you know, with a lot of big words. Um, and, and of course, 
of course, it's really difficult to be simple. You know, there's that quote from, I think it was Mark Twain who said, you know, I wrote you a long letter. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to write you a short one. Um, because it, it really does take time. You've got to do iterations and iterations to make things really simple and clear. You've got to actually know what you're talking about. Um, and uh, uh, that, that often takes many iterations of an idea. I think about the learning solutions we build and some of our solutions we've been iterating for like five to 10 years. And we're, they're so simple now, but they started really complex with like 20 ideas and then 10, then five. And then we finally worked out the three things that really matter. Um, and we can focus on those. So some, some things just take an evolution to actually work out what really matters. What else right. is coming up here? Yes, so um, talking about lack of clarity around expert, uh, expectations, um, I say a lot of that lack of clarity, failure to plan, lack of expertise, you know, um, kind of uh, ineffective forms of communication, not being clear. Um, Everyone wants to have a voice to justify their roles, a lack of agency. You know, I have a lot of like, you know, people trying to prove themselves or trying to cram a lot of information. They're, you know, we're trying, 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 and yet we're not always being effective is kind of what I'm, you know, getting the sense of what's coming through here. Trying to do too much too fast. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know if you're having this, this insight, Michaela, but we're going to, uh, we, we save the chat. I, I'd love to look through this later and code the responses that you have. Definitely. And then we and might have some more research. Um, and there are definite themes that are emerging. So yeah, yeah we might code that. and see if we can find three or four chunks of uh, common themes um, and then kind of study those a bit more and see what we see in that in some later later uh, research. It could be really, really interesting. Um, yeah, not wanting, not wanting anyone to feel left out is an interesting one from Janet. Um, you know, I mean, you can be over-inclusive in a way and end up with just, you know, complete overwhelm amount of information. So you want to be optimally inclusive, um, which is not under-inclusive, not over-inclusive. So there can be interesting challenges there. Let's go on. There's some really great comments coming in. Appreciate all the insights and links and connections. Um, let's talk about coherence and time. Um, so you probably don't know because we've been terrible at, at sharing some of our papers and I'm trying to change that a bit, but we actually wrote a whole paper on coherence. Um, and it's one of my favorite uh, papers. It's, it's such a fascinating topic. And um, coherence is actually the, the, the structural integrity of ideas. And when I say structural integrity, I mean that literally. So I'm going to give you a picture now to make it more fluent, less amount. Imagine an architect looking at a blueprint and they look at a blueprint and they can see if they're a really skilled architect in their you know, 20 or 30 or 40th year, uh, they can see looking at an, looking at a, a, a blueprint that something has structural integrity like this is going to hold together you know you've, you've worked within the rules of engineering versus this is going to fall apart you can't build that um, so they, they have really good models for structural integrity they know that you know there's a weight load issue they know things need to be connected they know things need to be balanced they know you can't you know put too much in anywhere so so architects physical architects understand structural integrity of buildings um, we have insight designers at NLI. We don't have instructional designers. We have insight designers. And they're really insight architects as well. And what we're looking at all, all the time is the structural integrity of the ideas that we're presenting. Um, so it took, you know, it took us um, three years to publish um, SCARF and about three and a half years to publish SEEDS because we weren't ready in terms of having the, the structural integrity really right. So I love coherence, if you can't tell. Um, it's such a fascinating concept that there's nowhere near kind of talked about. Um, and it's literally how information fits together. And it turns out to be a really, really important construct um, on, on so many levels. And, and I've been learning about this recently, and maybe Michaela, you'll have some comments. But the, the medial prefrontal, which is kind of the center of the prefrontal, it's such an interesting network. It's actually the social network on one level. So it's the network that's active when you're not doing anything. Um, so it's, it's the default network. Uh, it's a network for thinking about yourself and other people and how the connections work. So, so this medial prefrontal is actually about the connections between people. But it also turns out to be about the connections between ideas. And there's been a whole lot of research by Leila Devachi at NYU and others showing that when we can easily recall information, it's literally because new information has actually fit into our existing schema and that the medial prefrontal is active. 
is that when you learn something and you're not activating the medial prefrontal, uh, it doesn't stick because you're not actually seeing the relationships between everything. So the MPFC is almost like this relationships um, network in a way. It's kind of understanding and holding relationships between things. And it turns out people are important relationships to us, but it really does that for relationships between all ideas as well. It's such a fascinating thing. So, so new information, you know, like, you know, it's just a sound and in the brain, it's just electricity. This, um, this new information has to fit within existing networks in order for actually uh, you to make any sense of it at all. Uh, Michaela, do you want to riff on that at all? I know you're, you know, you've been closely involved in this, uh, some of this work of peripherally, but it's, it's such an interesting concept. I mean, it really is. And it's more like practical examples. So, um, you know, I love talking about the brain, but I just was, I was just thinking about music and, and dance and David, I know you're a musician and we, um, you know, for those I'm a musician too, and I play piano and I read notes. And for those of you, um, you know, for something fitting together, as you learn something, uh, those of you who play piano and you have to figure out your fingering. So you may say something on the, on the page and it's very complex, but you have to figure out what, what can I do to make it all fit together? So, um, and that helps us learn something. When we dance, you need to chunk things together, but it has to relate. The previous steps have to relate to the next steps. So, you know, as we think about coherence, we can think about it in terms of the workplace, you know, as managers, how do we impart information to the people we work with? But we can also think about it in other work uh, aspects of life, whether it's cooking, whether it's in terms of, of music and dance. Coherence is so important to learning because we do right. have to connect the new with what we already know. It's very right. profound. And, and, and as Molly's just mentioned, you know, storytelling is a way of developing coherence. Like a story is how things fit together. The story of, you know, who does what to whom and in what order, like stories uh, create coherence. I want to address the comment that's, that's come up um, from CJ, why coherence and not connection? It's a really interesting question. It's kind of one of the places I want to go. Coherence is, is much more than just how well things are connected. It's kind of a, a bigger concept, includes how well things are connected, but also includes like, are there extraneous elements that just don't need to be there? Um, are there duplications? Are there tangles? We've got two things that say the same thing that the, the, you know, is there one set of instructions for every idea? So it's, it's much more than just how things connect. And we actually broke it down at one point into about five variables. Um, and we're able to assess the coherence with data of like a, a learning solution. You know, we can look at a learning solution and, and, and say, this is the level of coherence. We did that some years ago with a, a, a delivery, a one day program that someone else had designed for a client. They asked us to assess coherence and we found uh, you know, 23 different models um, that, that, that half of them did the same things in a one day program. Uh, no one had like pulled back and said, hey, what are we trying to achieve and what's the most efficient way to do that? They just kind of thrown everything in there. Um, so when you think about structural integrity, it's not just do things fit, it's do they even need to be there? It's how well do they fit? Because there's a quality of connection as well. Um, and do, do they even make sense? It has to make sense because you can be presented with something and you're like, there is a disconnect because it doesn't make sense. You know, we're saying one thing here, but this, you know, there's evidence otherwise. And I just heard somebody, I just saw somebody write cognitive dissonance. It's yeah, almost, exactly. you know, an element of, of that. If something needs to make sense. Yeah, when something doesn't make sense, you basically make this unconscious decision. Either I'm not smart enough or the person putting this together wasn't smart enough. And usually we choose the latter um, and we discard information that doesn't fit together. So when something's not coherent, if we can't see how it all fits, the brain kind of says, eh, this obviously isn't important enough um, or, or you sort of have to decide you're not smart enough um, when you can't see how something is relevant. But usually we go to, you know, I just, I'm just not going to care about this because um, it's, you know, someone clearly hasn't thought through this enough. So I'll come back to it, you know, later. Or if we keep working on something, we get the Zaganic effect where the brain just keeps working on this and keeps working until you, you know, eventually find the connection. The other thing about coherence is it goes in lots of directions. There's, you know, if you're designing a complete like culture change program, there's vertical coherence between your vision, your mission, your values, your leadership principles, whatever you're doing, there's this vertical coherence. There's also horizontal coherence between say all the different learning programs that you have and how they fit together. So you want to think of coherence in multiple different ways. Um, and we didn't kind of prepare this today, but uh, if we did a whole session just on coherence, there's a there's, there's literally a very data-driven way to actually measure it 
um, of any particular uh, any particular like communication. Uh, could be a you know slide deck, um, could be a webinar, could be a training program. So you can actually measure in a quite a data driven way the actual coherence of an individual or a complete um, you know change program or learning strategy or even even just corporate strategy. You can measure the coherence of an organizational strategy. Uh, you know what their business strategy is. So it's a really really interesting construct to be uh, to be thinking about. You can tell we love it. Um, just a you know a way to think about it. Um, you know if you try to learn Japanese and you have no you know experience in that, it's really hard because you have no schema existing schema to build on. If you already speak Spanish and you're going to learn Italian, actually you have you have phonemes, which is a unit of sound. You have similar phonemes. You don't have to learn those. Japanese, you literally haven't practiced your mouth saying those sounds ever. So you don't literally know how to say the sounds. Um, you have the alphabet, you have the grammar, you have a whole lot of chunks that gives you a huge head start. Um, whereas learning a completely new language is really, really difficult. So this is a way to think about coherence. It's, it's much easier to tie into existing frameworks than a completely new one. There's another thing I think is really fascinating, um, really, really fascinating. This is this is like if you if you actually accept this, you might change just about everything that you do. People are only about twenty seven percent accurate, about quarter accurate when they make judgments about how well they understand something. In other words, about a quarter of the time, people actually understand something when they say they do. That's kind of crazy. Think about that for a minute. A quarter of the time, we understand something we think we do. So. Um, you know, you've got learning architects who are designing programs. They don't really even understand that you know what everything's about. Um, you've got leaders who think they understand what something's about. They really don't. Um, and we're rushing to put out content. We're rushing to put out, you know, different different material, different marketing material. But we actually don't really understand what we're doing a lot of the time. So one of the sources of poor coherence is we think other people understand what we're talking about. They don't actually understand a lot of what we're talking about. Um, and so we've got to put more work into this. One of the, the habits we worked on with uh, Microsoft, uh, we got down to three words, was um, ensure shared understanding. So um, it was actually one of the practices they're called there. So there's principles and practices. And uh, ensure shared understanding became this really, really important uh, practice within the context of create clarity. Uh, ensure shared understanding. And it's such an important thing to do given, uh, given this factor. So this is one of the reasons for poor coherence. This is also really interesting for those of you involved in learning. Um, if we think about learning coherence, the, um, uh, the, a lot of people in learning kind of love like these fun, seductive, interesting details um kind of novelty so we, we often think when designing learning that people need novelty this was actually studied and what they found is that when lectures included novelty uh, people actually recalled um less so you know just pushing for the novel is not the way that you improve learning for example and i see this all the time a company will say hey we're going to keep this really fresh and interesting so we're going to bring in you know three different thought leaders your one we're going to bring three different thought leaders to all talk about leadership and then I look at what I'm going to say, what the other two people are going to say, and I'm going to say, this might look novel to you, but people's heads are going to explode because nothing's going to fit together. It's more important that everything fits together than everything's novel. Um, and, but we see, we see kind of a pushback around this. So interesting stuff. I mean, here are some things to do. You know, the why is a really big one. Um, you know, connecting things together is really important. Relating back to goals all of that. Uh, Michaela, anything you want to jump into before we go to time? I'm looking at time and I'll make sure we'll spend less on time and kind of get to the, the conversation in a minute. Anything you want to add on yeah. coherence? No, I was just thinking about um, organizations. When you talked about, you know, we talked with the organizations about being coherent. Again, what is your message that you're trying to convey to the people who are working for you? And, you know, when we think about parents, what is that term like, do as I say, not as I do, but we have to model that behavior. And so when we think as organizations or even as leaders, what are we saying and are we actually modeling that? And if there's a disconnect, it's not coherent. People are going to, you know, consciously or unconsciously see or feel a disconnect. So it's really important in our messaging, whether we're individuals, we're managers, we're leaders or organizations that we are consistent and that we'll, our messaging makes sense. And it, it all connects with one another and people can you know understand the coherent right. whole message and that's really important and, and to tie this together the more that message is fluent like you know clarity energy success 
and it's not much information, like the amount's low, like in that case, and it's coherent, right? Now you can really, you know, hold these ideas in mind and do things with them. So when you develop a set of culture principles that are really fluent and, and easy to recall and use, it, it has this really interesting effect. So we've been we've been talking to a lot of companies about culture lately. They're really anxious that their culture is going to evaporate, but um, you know, having a framework is really helpful for everyone to know what really matters. But you also want to remember that culture is learned through watching what people do, watching the habits that, that are at work. Um, and we really learn that from watching faces and watching people's facial responses and emotional responses on their face um, as they work. So, you know, it provides you keep cameras on in your interactions. Culture should be pretty intact, even more so if you've got a really, really clear architecture for what matters. Um, that's fluent, isn't too big, and is coherent. And then finally, um, you know, you're giving people time to process. So one of the things that, uh, and maybe I'm guilty of this, maybe I'm the worst person at this, but it, it takes about a third of a second to really process a sound. Um, now, if English is your second language, you, you're probably having a rough time today because I'm going very quickly. Um, it, it, but even really fluent people, you've, it takes a, a beat to process an idea and connect it to different ideas. But now when you think about like a slide that has, you know, like an eye chart, like a ton of information, it might take you five minutes just to actually understand the data and just hold it and process it and see any relevance. And yet I'm often the subject of presentations where, you know, folks already understand it and assume that I will be able to understand it in 10 seconds or 30 seconds. Um, so we're misunderstanding, we're often misunderstanding the time it takes to process something. Um, and, and it really does take, uh, you know, a bit of time to kind of get an idea into our head. And what's, diff what's interesting is people have different times for that. And, and I think Amazon had it right when they said, you know, process at the start of a meeting with a document so that people can read fast, read slow, go back and forward, do it how they need to. And we do that at NLI with all our internal meetings and consulting, everything, um, you know, we'll have a document people can process. Uh, so no one's having to present it. It's really powerful. But, you know, one of the things with time, you've obviously got to reserve time for complex or abstract information. In our internal meetings and consulting, if you're watching us work, you would regularly see us, some, one of our, whoever's leading the meeting would often say, I'm going to shut up for two minutes and let you process what we've just said and think about the implications or any questions. Well, often, just about every meeting will happen at least once, um, is we'll say, hey, that was a lot to process. Let's just shut up and think um, and just take some time to digest this. And then all this really rich stuff. We might say, you know, don't be in the chat, be on pen and paper. Just, you know, look away from the screen for two minutes. Let's just be quiet. And we're just going to think about everything we've just talked about and reflect on it. We'll come back together in two minutes or three minutes, whatever. Um, you know, make some notes on paper. And then once you've looked at your notes, see what's really meaningful and put that in the chat. Um, so you're giving people time for complex or abstract information to really process and also allowing people to process at their own pace. Um, and of course, giving people breaks to, you know, to process these things as well. So we're not thinking enough about time. Um, you know, processing does require sufficient time. It's, it's like, it, it really is um, something that you can't kind of um, you know, get around. So here's another question for you. As we think about coherence and time, what else might be behind the lack of coherence and good time management around process informa information? Now, maybe it's similar things that you, from, from fluency and amount. I don't know. I'm curious. In, in an organizational context, what's driving lack of coherence and um, really managing time? Let's get some comments in the chat seeing um, things like poor planning, lack of um, architecture, tyranny of the urgent. I like that, I haven't heard that. Yeah, yeah. I like that, um, very sticky. Um, background info on the topics. Under, I'm assuming others understand what we understand, kind of speaking, talking about what you were talking about earlier, David, you know, assuming we'll say something, and of course people know what we're talking about. <laughs> Stupid deadlines, um, you know, rushing, unrealistic expect expectations. Um, losing sight of the real goal, not having a clear goal. Um, there's a lot about just the rush, the urgency, um, even an addiction to that. Um, too many distractions. So I think people are, there's a lot resonating. There are a lot of responses coming in around this. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, just because we can go fast doesn't mean we should. 
you know, cars can go at 150 miles an hour. Does it mean we should? No, we've put limits on that, right? Um, yeah, we could, in theory, do 18 hours a day of meetings. Should we? No. You know, we could do 12. Should we? No. Uh, probably, in terms of really focusing and interacting, probably three or four hours is a lot in a day, but with a, you know, a gap between, in terms of still having your full capacity, right? Your exactly. capacity would be limited otherwise. So we want to realize that we want to create um, a healthy, we want to be healthy, right? And so as you were saying, David, just because we can work and do things doesn't mean we should be doing that all the time. We need, you know, the opportunity to recover, to relate to other people. And, you know, I would just like to mention inclusion when we think about time and we're working with any number of people who could be facing all kinds of stressors. Uh, uh, distractors to their attention. And there are some people on the degrees of attention, you know, from, you know, I'll just say like attention deficit disorder, that information coming in too much or from too many different people can really um, be right. off putting and they can't take in information. Somebody, uh, English, we're just saying, you know, in the US, we normally speak English. English might be their second, third, or fourth language, which means it's going to take longer for them to process that information. Right, right. It might be visually impaired, hearing impaired. So just even thinking as I speak fast, right? How do we slow things down? Right, right, right. Capacity. I mean, it's it's interesting. When we first like used the word at the summit, I actually asked at the end of that summit um, how many people have thought about capacity like multiple times a day. Pretty much the whole room put their head up. It became this real feature of uh, of that you know, of that event um, with just like really thinking about capacity. So here's the framework, fluence, fluent amount, coherence, and time. And I have a question for you in the last two minutes. Um, stay with us, because uh, I'm really interested in this question. What do you think organizations can do about this? Um, I'm really curious to see what's out there in the chat. What do you think organizations can do about this, about the, um, the uh, um, whole lack of capacity awareness? What could organizations do about this? Let's get some comments in the chat. Because it's a, you know, it's it's a it's a human, I mean, it's it's a real human need, like eating. You know, we 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 respect our capacity to digest food, right? Human organizations respect food digestion capacity. We don't seem to respect cognitive digestion capacity. You know, we give people a week's worth of food to eat in a day and think they can just do it. What can organizations do? No meeting Fridays. I love no meeting Mondays or minimal meeting Mondays. It's hard to do no minimal meeting Mondays because your brain is fresher. You get more work done versus Fridays where you're just exhausted and you won't actually get much done anyway. Space between meetings. Yeah, 25 and 50 minute meetings, a gap every three meetings. So after three, you know, and these need to be principles. They can't be rules, but you know, hard principles. Clarify purpose. And like Michael said, change the model, bites, not meals. Right. We need to digest information. We literally digest information. We need the time to digest information. Yeah. You know, our learning solutions, um, we don't really do one off learning events. We do a month. So so we basically break any big idea like allyship or inclusion or breaking bias. We, we break this out into the three biggest insights and then give you a month to digest them one at a time. Um, in all sorts of different ways with you know, really little snippets. So I, I think it's a, it's a really, um, it's really powerful to rem remember that. It's, this is relevant to learning, to communication, to marketing, to sales, to meetings, to really all of it. Keep those comments coming. Really interested to see what folks say. Um, boundaries or what we call road rules and speed limits is interesting. Keep those comments coming. It's really interesting. Let's make sure we save this and take a look at this. Um, and I just like to add and just acknowledge what Lindsay said, and somebody else mentioned this before too, but she said empathy for the human experience, just sitting and considering the others. Right, right. Empathy for the human experience. You know, I've mentioned the summit a few times. Our next summit's been scheduled. It's, uh, it's going to be virtual, maybe with some in-person sites all around the world. Um, so a whole bunch of in-person sites if we can do it, but it's going to be a, a two-day virtual event. And uh, actually what we're going to focus on is making organizations regenerative as opposed to just sustainable. So, and the way to do that is really respect the limits that we have, like understand the human limits around capacity, motivation, and bias. Um, so we're gonna do a ton of work on that in February. Hold, hold the date to, uh, to be there. Um, maybe one of my team can put a link in or the date um, for, uh, for that. It's coming up next year. Um, let's, uh, Shelby, let's get the, the um, we're in the last few minutes. Let's get the, um, 
the poll up, the closing poll for folks who want to jump off. Um, so let's get the poll up so that people know kind of what to do next. But as we wrap this up, um, I think, you know, it's such an interesting framework um, that's that we haven't loved much at NLI. I'm not really sure why, um, but it's, it's such an important issue that like respecting capacity. And I think that, um, that this is an architecture that helps you kind of break it out and really see where the issues are and see what you can fix. You know, it's not a disruptive model like scarf and seeds or that you're kind of seeing it every day. Um, although you might, you might start to see fluency issues everywhere if you spend some time on this. Um, but throw in the, in the poll kind of how we can help you and how we can help follow up. Um, and otherwise, just I really appreciate the opportunity to spend this time with you. Uh, Michaela, any closing thoughts? On, I just on, want to say I just want to say I felt very energized by everybody's participation and their contributions. We definitely will be looking at that, and as David said, coding that and finding those themes and finding out what's really important to you and um, you know what is top of mind. So thank you for joining us today. Fantastic, thanks so much, Shelby. I'll, I'll hand back to you, uh, everyone. Thanks for being here. Take oh, care great. of yourselves. Look after each other. Keep doing what matters. Not try to do everything. Um, and I think you're going to enjoy the next. Uh, month or so of these events. We've got some really exciting content coming up. Back, uh, back to you, Shelby.